questions, and we start with question number one from Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it is aware of energy company practices that exacerbate fuel poverty and indebtedness of vulnerable households seeking to reconnect their supplies following disconnection. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. The Scottish Government is concerned that the UK Government has failed to create an energy market that serves all Scottish households fairly, particularly those in vulnerable circumstances. Ofgem's latest data shows there were no disconnections in Scotland in 2017, which is welcome. However, these da data do not capture the daily reality of self-disconnection faced by fuel poor, indebted and vulnerable households. Self-disconnection data are not currently reported on and we continue to call for Ofgem to further investigate the hidden impact of self-disconnection in line uh, with the refresh of its consumer vulnerability strategy. Bob Doris. Thank the Minister for that answer. And I raised concerns before Christmas of the issue of unreasonable barrier for households in the Wynford estate and my constituency to get reconnected to their heating and hot water supply. And in my office worked with the Citizens Advice and the Scottish and Southern Energy to secure 33 households got reconnected by Christmas Eve. However, presiding officer, dozens of homes remain disconnected and significant concerns remain about prohibitive reconnection charges unreasonable repayment schedules and how energy companies are defining vulnerable households, for instance, not including families with children. Can I ask the Minister that whilst I appreciate the reserved nature of energy, fuel poverty is very much this Parliament's concern and can I therefore ask the Minister to meet with myself to see how we can support vulnerable households in such situations? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I should uh, start out by congratulating Mr Doris on the work he's done to help those 33 households before Christmas. I commend him and indeed my colleagues such as Christina McKelvey who's done a, a, I know, an enormous amount of work around uh, providing uh, support to vulnerable customers in, in risk, risk of dis disconnection for their, for their uh, supplies. Um, Bob Doris is right to raise this issue. Scotland's uh, vulnerable energy consumers remain a very high priority for this government. He's right to say fuel poverty uh, is a key priority for the government and that's why in 2016 we called the Summit of Energy Companies to discuss action towards addressing fuel poverty and the extra costs that low-income families face. In January of last year, the second energy summit met and challenged energy suppliers and consumer groups to work collaboratively towards improved uh, consumer outcomes in line with our ambition to eradicate fuel poverty. And this work remains a high priority as we develop our Scottish Energy Consumer Vision and Action Plan. And the energy companies have been supportive to date in the work we're trying to do in that respect. So I'd be very happy to meet Mr Doris uh, to tell him more about the work we are already doing, but clearly keen to hear from him the experience of his constituents around uh, reconnection charges and to understand the impacts it's having on, on families in his area. Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and uh, noting my register of interest in renewable energy, uh, can I ask the Scottish Government what plans they have to close the gap on fuel poverty between urban and rural housing? Minister. Uh, Mr Burnett raises a fair point, but clearly in the debates we've had around energy efficient Scotland and fuel poverty, the government has acknowledged the, the, uh, the additional factors that sometimes impact on rural households. Clearly in many cases uh, they have faced greater exposure in terms of their, their, their properties and therefore have um, higher need to, to heat their properties and of course the fuels they use can often be more expensive than uh, those customers are able to access gas through the main system. So we do very much are taking forward the thoughts around both rural and island communities in the work we're doing in support of Energy Efficient Scotland. And my colleague Kevin Stewart, who's leading for the government on fuel poverty, uh, is also very uh, much involved in that work. Indeed, Mr Stewart has, has joined us in the chamber, and I'm sure myself and, and Mr Stewart will be keen to hear from members around how they feel we can best tackle uh, fuel poverty in rural areas. Question number two, Finlay Carson. Cabinet Secretary, Jean Freeman. The staffing of ambulances is an operational matter for the Scottish Ambulance Service. However, we expect the service to ensure that all ambulance resources are staffed appropriately to meet patient needs. Finlay Carson. Over a decade ago, the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, warned against single crew call-outs while she was Health Secretary. And she said at the time, and I quote, the policy of the Scottish Government is clear traditional accident and emergency ambulances should be double crewed with at least one member of the crew being a paramedic unless in exceptional circumstances. This is not happening in Dumfries and Galloway where in some instances ambulance crews are manned solely by technicians potentially putting patients at risk. Is this yet another example that even after 11 years in power this MP government is failing to deliver on their policy commitments and will the cabinet secretary commit to urgently address this worrying situation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, let me start by saying uh, no, it absolutely is not an example because 
the fact of the matter is that Scottish ambulances are not routinely single crewed, although there can be exceptional circumstances where that happens. The percentage of shifts covered by a single crewed ambulance in the southwest region for the period July to September 2018 was 2% against a national average of 2.3%. So I think those percentages not only demonstrate uh, the impact of the delivery of that policy in uh, Mr Carson's region, but also across the, the, the country. The ambulance service has an action plan, it, it would be helpful, uh, presiding officer, if I address the question that we heard through the microphone system as opposed to the one I'm hearing in my ear. The ambulance service has an action plan to reduce instances of single crewing wherever possible. This is being monitored by us through regular update reports. However, none of our emergency workers should have to worry about their own safety as they carry out their work. And the Emergency Workers Act includes penalties of up to 12 months imprisonment or a £10,000 fine or both to be imposed following convictions for offences against ambulance staff. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'd be grateful to the Cabinet Secretary could provide me on uh, her position on ensuring that there is enough ambulance provision to cover Inverclyde when ambulances are taking patients to the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr McMillan for that question. It is very important when ambulances are away from their local area taking patients to hospital that sufficient resource remains in the area to meet the needs of local communities. And this is a matter that has been raised uh, with me elsewhere and that I am continuing to discuss uh, with the Scottish Ambulance Service in terms of how they are rolling out their test of change, which uh, most recently uh, has been introduced to cover the Elgin to Aberdeen corridor. Uh, in order to ensure this cover, SAS uh, should undertake a practice of backfilling using resources from other stations where appropriate, and they also use tactical deployment points where ambulances are stationed at specific points throughout the country and not just based at their station to ensure that coverage is as wide as possible. However, this uh, and other matters remain a subject of ongoing discussion uh, between me and the Scottish Ambulance Service to ensure that the resources that are there, and we have made additional resources available to that service are deployed appropriately to suit both the patient and the geographical demands of our country. Question number three, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Citizens Basic Income pilot schemes. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. Thank you. Following our commitment to explore a citizen basic income scheme, we made available a grant worth £250,000 for local authorities to scope out the feasibility of small pilots. Glasgow, Edinburgh, Fife and North Ayrshire made a successful collective bid in March 2018. A steering group composed of the four local authorities and NHS Health Scotland with support from the Scottish <coughs> Government have begun research into the feasibility of a pilot. John Meese. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I'm just wondering if it is really possible to do a full pilot scheme if the DWP is not involved and if we do not have control over their functions, because clearly for a lot of people their income is coming from the DWP. Cabinet Secretary. So any decision to proceed with a pilot will be subject to the findings of the steering group's feasibility study and that will set out the full details of the ethical, legislative, financial and the practical implementation of a pilot on the ground. But the member is absolutely right to raise this because a pilot scheme would not be viable without full powers over tax and social security or at the very least full cooperation of the UK government and we are in contact with the DWP about this and engagement is ongoing and we'll endeavour to keep the member updated on the progress on this. Question three, sorry, question four has been withdrawn. Question five, Graeme Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Lanarkshire and what was discussed. Camera Secretary Jean Freeman. Um, Ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Lanarkshire, to discuss matters of importance uh, to local people. I last met the Chair of the Health Board on the 10th of December and will meet her again this coming Monday. Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, the number of uh, GP practices has fallen by 10% in Lanarkshire since 2007. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what she's doing about this? Cabinet Secretary. Um, so, Mr Simpson, I, I hope, is aware uh, of our primary care reform plan. 
uh, which incorporates, of course, the new GP contract uh, and other measures. That primary care reform plan uh, has significant additional resource uh, planned for it in the current draft budget, so I would look for his support uh, to that budget uh, for that additional resource. What that does is look at how we uh, deliver uh, on the GP contract, in particular the areas around multi-skilling uh, on the GP clusters in order to ensure that the provision is uh, appropriate across, across local areas, taking account of geography and elsewhere. And I've had discussions with colleagues around uh, particularly uh, the demands and issues uh, for rural practices, making sure that that develops in a way that uh, uh, fulfills uh, our need and the need of local people to ensure that individuals receive the right care from the right professional at the right time. Uh, that all alongside the significant additional resource, uh, again in the draft budget, and again I look for that support uh, in terms of increasing GP training, the numbers uh, of our uh, undergraduate medical students supporting the continuation of Scott Gem and of course the continuation of the specific measures that we have introduced in order to encourage uh, GPs into uh, more remote and rural areas. Question number six, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the announcement by the DWP that the two-child limit on universal credit payments will be partially rolled back. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Although the UK Government's decision not to extend the two-child cap and rape clause will be welcome news for a small number of Scottish families, it changes nothing for families with third or subsequent children born af after April 2017. Tens of thousands of families will still feel the negative impacts of the two-child limit in the longer term, which effectively creates a two-tier system. Critically, it does nothing to remove the rape clause, which is a dehumanising and appalling abuse of both the child and parents' human rights. The Scottish Government has long called on the UK Government to end the two-child limit and within it the abhorrent rape clause and will continue to do so. Bill Kidd. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's answer. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell the Chamber how many people have been impacted and will be impacted by the two-child cap? what amount of money they'll lose and what difference this partial rollback will make? Cabinet Secretary. Well, DWP statistics show that in the first year of the two-child limit, 3,800 Scottish families did not receive entitlement for the third or subsequent child. Our analysts have estimated that up to 40,000 households across Scotland will ultimately still be affected by the two-child limit, resulting in a reduction in welfare spend in Scotland of around £120 million by 2020-2021 when the policy is fully implemented and UC fully rolled out. Early analysis shows that less than 1,000 families will be impacted by the recent announcement by the UK Government. That is why we will continue to call for the two-child cap and the rape clause to be scrapped in its entirety. Question number seven, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the new required qualifications for childcare practitioners. Minister Marie Todd. There's a significant body of evidence and analysis, not least the 2017 Health Scotland Evidence Review, Child Care Quality and Children's Outcomes, that links having well-qualified, high-quality workforce to improving outcomes for children. That's why the National Standard for Early Learning and Child Care Providers, provided, published jointly with COSLA in December, requires that all staff included in adult-to-child ratios must have either obtained or be working towards the benchmark qualification for their role. For the first time, there'll be a requirement on childminders to be qualified or to be working towards a qualification to the same level as other ELC practitioners. All registered staff delivering funded entitlement will, from August 2020, have at least started to work towards their qualification, rather than waiting until the end of the full five-year registration period in which um, to secure the relevant qualification, which we believe will further enhance the quality of ELC. Michelle Ballantyne. I thank the Minister for that answer. But does she recognise that there are a significant number of managers, particularly older managers, who already run successful, high-quality private nurseries that may now be forced out of their careers because undertaking a Level 9 qualification at such a late point in their careers is neither desirable nor feasible? The Scottish Government know that we need a high number of experienced managers for the expansion of 1140 hours to succeed. 
Will the government commit to reviewing whether or not an exception should be made for the demand for a level nine qualification for an individual that is already in post and where an inspection process has already provided insurance on the quality of the services being delivered? Minister. Let me just reiterate, as I said in my first answer, there are, are very few changes in this. Since um, the registration of the ELC workforce is regulated by the SSSC, since 2011, the all registered ELC managers and lead practitioners must either hold the SEQF Level 9 benchmark qualification or agree that their registration is subject to a comment that they secure this within their first period of registration. The requirement for these staff to obtain these qualifications has not changed as a result of the national standard. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Minister if these new childcare qualifications include training in tackling poverty? Because this is particularly relevant this week with the Sunday Mail revelation that the staff in Broomlow and Nursery and Govan are feeding children and their parents with donations from local businesses. And whilst compassionate staff are of course to be commended for taking direct action, surely the Minister will agree that such poverty is unacceptable in our rich country. What exactly is the Scottish Government going to do about this shocking situation? Minister. I absolutely agree that that's an unacceptable situation. You'll know that this is a particular passion of mine, that we live in the sixth richest country in the world and have the hungriest children in Europe, which is largely down to the UK government's welfare system. Yeah. <laughs> Question number eight, Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish Government how are the proposals in the draft budget aim to support communities in the Renfrewshire South constituency? Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government is committed to delivering inclusive economic growth across all of Scotland and the 2019-20 Scottish budget sets out a continued commitment to invest in regeneration activity, to stimulate sustainable and inclusive growth and to empower and improve the well-being of people and communities. Tom Arthur. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Recent years have seen significant investment with new housing in Johnston, new council housing in Barhead for the first time in the generation and the regeneration of Barhead's town centre. Can the Cabinet Secretary say how this budget will continue to support housing and the regeneration and improvement to our town centres? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there's more investment to come, specifically on town centres as part of the draft budget. There's a proposal for £50 million. I will work on the distribution and allocation in partnership with COSLA and on housing. We'll continue that track record of delivery. In 2019-20, the Affordable Housing Supply Programme has confirmed a resource planning assumption of £15.6 million for Renfrewshire. The Council's Strategic Housing Investment Plan indicates that 286 new homes will be completed in 2019-20, with site starts planned for a further 839. And for completeness, for East Renfrewshire, a resource planning assumption of £5.9 million has been confirmed. This will allow that council to complete the 22 new homes and in 2019-20 will have site starts of a further 134. That is the Scottish Government working in partnership with local authorities to regenerate our town centres and deliver the housing that Scotland needs. Question number nine, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is and whether non-looked-after kinship carers should receive the same level of financial support that foster carers and looked-after kinship carers receive when looking after children who have experienced family breakups or the death of a parent. Minister Marie Todd. Kinship carers of non-looked-after children can receive the same level of financial support as foster carers where there is a kinship care order in place under Section 11 of the Children in Scotland Act. We are aware that kinship care orders are not always right in some individual cases and the member has raised a number of issues with the Minister over some time and I'm, I'm thankful for that. We continue to be conscious of these issues and consider how best to make sure that kinship carers get the support that they need. Willie Coffey. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. I have uh, constituents who are kinship carers have involuntarily taken in, for example, their grandchildren. They don't meet the criteria for kinship care allowance which seems only to be payable if there's a risk element involved and so are struggling financially. Will the Minister consider reviewing this criteria for the kinship care allowance to make it available for non-looked-after kinship care cases? 
Minister. The agreement on kinship care allowances doesn't apply to all kinship carers, and, and as you state, this has raised concerns amongst those who don't meet the eligibility criteria. The Scottish Government provides clear guidance on how local authorities should assess whether a child is at risk of becoming looked after. And obviously, as with all such guidance, we'll keep these matters under constant review. Because each kinship carer's circumstances are unique, the Scottish Government funds Citizens Advice Scotland to provide a specialised advice for kinship carers, along with signposting to local support services, support in financial and legal matters. And we've worked with and will continue to work with our social security colleagues, including those in Westminster, to ensure that kinship carers can access a variety of benefits to alleviate the additional costs for caring for their families' children.